Hello and welcome to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd, and we've got a fun episode today with Alejandro from Rainier, and he is talking a little bit about his company and the, the power of storytelling and how they went through a process of identifying that they wanted to be the best storytellers in their industry, the impact that's had on the company so far, and the impact they think it'll have in three years from now. This is a really good episode. I'm glad you're here. You'll be glad you're here too. Uh, as you're listening to this episode and you're finding it thought-provoking and insightful, I'll take a moment to share it with your colleagues also. Welcome to On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by ReviewMaxer. Hello and welcome to On Top of PR. I'm your host, Jason Mudd. Uh, you're tuned in to another great episode. We are joined today by uh, my friend and our guest today, Alejandro Barbero. He is with Rainier. Welcome to the show, Alejandro. Hey, Jason. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to have you here. I'm glad you're here. And uh, we want to welcome you to the show by uh, asking you to introduce yourself real quick. Give us a couple of sentences about who you are and what you do at Rainier. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, my name is Alejandro Barbero. I, I work for Rainier. I'm the director of strategic communications. I've been with the company about 17 and a half years now uh, in different capacities. And a um, little bit about me, I'm a, I'm a family guy. I, you know, if you ask my team, they will always say, you know, family come first. Um, and then I'm a strategy guy. Um, I love big ideas. I love um, strategizing and I love getting things done as well. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, we can tell you're a family man with all your lovely family photos in the background. So uh, thanks for sharing those with us. <laughs> um, you know, I'm very familiar with Rainier, um, having, you know, known you and the company for decades or at least the company for decades and knowing you for years. But I bet most of our audience has never heard of Rainier. So why don't you explain uh, give kind of the elevator pitch or the background story on Rainier real fast? Absolutely. So um, company was founded in 1926 in Washington State. We are in the forestry business. Um, and today we have 2.7 million acres of timberlands in the US and in New Zealand in two regions in the US, the US South and the Pacific Northwest, um, and also in New Zealand. Um, we have three main businesses, the forestry business, the real estate business, and then what we call the land resources business, which is, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a couple dozen of different businesses that will include things like your hunting and recreation, your cell tower leases, your billboards, your pine straw leases, things of that nature. Um, some. I always say this way, some you do while the trees grow, some you'll do, you know, instead of growing trees, um, but it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collection of different businesses. Right, absolutely. And so years ago, the company decided to focus on um, uh, real estate and timber and spun off uh, its paper uh, mill or manufacturing facilities. Is that right? That is correct. So. Um, the company, you know, one thing I love about the company is the company uh, has taken multiple different shapes uh, over its almost 100 year old life. Um, and, you know, in our current shape, back in 2014, we spun out our manufacturing division. Um, we call it performance fibers at the time. So they have two mills, one in Jessup, Georgia, one in Fernandina Beach, Florida, uh, where they manufacture high purity cellulose pulp. Um, and we spun them out as a publicly traded company. And um, today we are what we call a pure play, um, it, which is basically a company that doesn't have any manufacturing. We only focus on, on timber. Okay, excellent. So tell us, how did you get into uh, this industry and profession? <clears throat> huh. um, that's a great question. So um, the... It, it, it's a fun story. So um, uh, rewind to 2003, I, um, I, I finished my MBA in the University of Michigan um, in probably one of the worst job markets that the world has seen. Um, and it, I, I started my job search, you know, school finished and I continued my job search. Um, and there was a posting about a particular role. I was very clear on the role that I wanted to have. I wanted a sort of strategy with a heavy mix of finance type role. Um, and, and I was on my quest to find that job and, and Rayonier had it. Um, they posted it on the university's website 
And you know, next thing you know, that led to multiple interviews. And about October, they made the offer. And um, November 17th of 2003, that's when I started. Um, and then as far as the profession, um, my, my professional career has been very interesting. Um, there's a common thread in everything I've done, which is the strategy piece, whether corporate or business strategy. But I, I, I've been in multiple different capacities where I apply those sort of strategic you know, planning skills. Um, and you know, today, I, I run the communication function. Um, and you know, we're all about sort of building a brand, and building a brand strategy, building a communication strategy. Um, but I've done business management before. I've done strategic planning for divisions before. I've done corporate development before. So um, multiple different roles within the company, but all with this sort of common thread of the strategy behind it. Gotcha. Well, it sounds like you have an eclectic mix of experiences and one I'm sure that's very valued with the multiple roles and departmental experience, bringing all that into uh, corporate communications and, and marketing strategy is probably very helpful to the enterprise. Yeah, you know, I, I always like to stay, you know, there's a line between, um, you know, what we dub the support functions and, and and what we dub, you know, the operations. And I always like to kind of straddle the line, like like be on that line. And sometimes I'm on the business side, sometimes I'm on the support side and the back of the business, back on the support. Um, and that, give, that always gives me that, you know, kind of two sides of the story perspective. Um, you know, I'm like, you know, one example today, from the communication side, I work with the hunting and recreation team. Um, and, you know, seven years ago or eight years ago, I was sitting on their role working with the communication function. So I kind of know, you know, what they're up against and what they need, and I can help them better uh, mm -hmm. by having been there in their shoes before. Right. It's very uh, a holistic view, and uh, you bring uh, a lot of experience and background and, and probably uh, very valued collaboration to the equation also. That's that's the plan. So I've I've got to ask you. Remind me. Uh, you know what is your uh, what's your origin or 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 or, or culture? Uh, obviously, you've got an accent. So tell me more about that. So I grew up in Argentina. That's where where I'm from. That's where my wife is from, and both our families are from. Um, and um, I went to in engineering school. Um, I became a civil engineer a long long time ago. <laughs> um, and um, as I was sort of finishing school. Um, you know, engineering only gives you so much, and um, and I'm, I'm grateful for having gone to engineering. But I'm also knowing, you know, some of the limitations that I had, you know, as a mm -hmm. professional, if I wanted to pursue a corporate career, which is what I wanted to do. So um, soon before finishing, you know, I, I had this idea that you know, an MBA um, in in a different country was was something that I wanted to to chase and pursue. Um, and you know, a, a number of years after I graduated, it, it, it kind of became a reality um, back in 2001 when I when I moved to the states. It's about 20 years this year. I gotcha. Well, uh, I, I'm going to ask you next about what's a typical day. Walk me through it. Uh, obviously, your routine has probably changed in in the COVID era. But you know, if you could find some balance between working from home and and when you used to work in the office, what's a typical day for you? Yeah, I would say, you know, there are many things that uh, change because of uh, the pandemic, but um, my routine is probably one that I improved. And, and, and so it typically goes uh, about 6.30, it's when the alarm goes off, um, kids up, and we I take them to school every morning. So we typically around 7, 10, 7, 15, get on the car with the dog and go to school to take him <laughs> to school. Um, and then quick breakfast on the way back uh and then it's it's planning uh planning the day and and then there's typically a host of conference calls or zoom calls that i'm in uh through the day and um it's a mix of um you know thinking time action time and, and conference calling time um and um about twice a week, I pick him up from school, kind of halfway through the day, and and then it's family time. It's um, it's dinner and uh, homework, and you know if we have time for a you know a game or a movie um, through the week, we'll squeeze that in, or um, you know or back to bed, maybe a, a movie, my wife and I, and uh, we'll start again next year, next day. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, I knew you're very family focused, and I appreciate that. 
my son is in high school and they don't start till nine. And so giving, you know, some days I'm able to give him a ride to school with the dog in tow also. Right. But uh, that really interferes with my work day, you know, because it's kind of seems late in the day for me for school to start at nine. But, you know, I, I love telling him and when I was in school, you know, we were starting if it wasn't 7 a.m. It was certainly eight, not nine. So um, yeah. tell me in your current role, uh, who does your company want to reach? Who's kind of your target audience for your communications? That's a great question. We we defined it in we basically target five different audiences. Um, wow. And, okay. And those are um, employees, future employees, um, communities, and then we have investors and customers. Um, and I'm thinking sort of you know the the, the corporate brand. We have mm -hmm. a, a few sub brands that are sort right. of more. Um, more on the B2C world, uh, they may have different interests. But at, at a corporate level, those are the five that we that we target. And my group specifically, we focus on employees, on future employees, and communities. And we use the word community, you know, in the loose sense of community. That you know, you can slice that onion in, in multiple different ways. But you know, we, we sort of use the word community in a in a in a loose mm -hmm. way. Um, and uh, we we are. A, you know, as we continue to evolve the communication function in the company, um, you know, we start to get focused more, you know, more laser focus on, okay, when you say communities, what exactly are you talking about? Um, and then we have a group that has a, you know, a phenomenal capacity managing investor relations and investor relation communication. Um, so they handle that. And then as far as customers go, um, what, I, what I always say is, um, you know, what a B2B company, um, you know, most of our business is relationship driven. Um, and so the the way we work, um, you know, on my group, the way we tackle that audience is we, we focus on that audience is making sure that our employees wear their pride on the company really high. Um, so we really focus on the employee side um, and more so than the, on the, you know, on the direct customer communication. Uh, we want to make sure um, you know, employees are empowered, they feel pride about the company, they're excited about what they do. And if they do all those things, then magic's gonna happen. You know, no brochures or no communication piece that I could do on our end um, will ever, you know, supplant mm -hmm. the, 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 the trust that our employees build uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So, um, so in summary, we are focusing on employees, um, you know, capturing their pride and making them feel pride about the company, you know, making sure everyone knows who they are and what they do. Right. Um, you know, the, um, we're focused on future employees, <laughs> um, anywhere from, you know, making sure we go talk to, you know, kids in school. Uh, mm -hmm. and when I say kids in school, you know, middle schoolers, high schoolers, elementary schoolers, about forestry as an option, we engage in the community, uh, or we go talk to kids in, in forestry school. Um, and, and, and then, um, and then we'll focus on communities, which is, you know, I think um, it, it's probably the piece that I'm, you know, I'm most passionate about. And, and, and it goes because um, for the longest time, um, I think our industry and our companies were conditioned to uh, basically stay under the radar. Uh, you know, it was a good thing to not be on the front uh, page of the paper. And, and what that led to was, you know, if you, you know this far better than I do, Jason. If you don't tell your story, well, you're letting somebody else tell your story. Mm -hmm. um, and I think our industry has suffered from, you know, not being able, you know, not be willing or you know, not taking the initiative in tell our own story. Um, so back in 2017, when we kind of got into, you know, hey, we gotta we gotta pay attention to the brand and refresh our brand and and, and start growing the brand. Um, that was sort of the driving factor. You know, there was a clear opportunity for us as a company to take that leadership role. Um, you know, we gotta we gotta show the industry this is how you can be a good storyteller. And so we embarked on this. You know, we planted the vision that we want to be the best storytelling company in the industry. Period. Um, and we just started kind of marching that way. <clears throat> and you know, we we built the platform, and then we built the engine, and then you know, we put the people in place. Um, and we've been in this journey of, you know, being storytellers for the industry for, I don't know, two, three years now. And, you know, recognized as leaders within the industry, in, um, which is, is grateful to be, you know, it's, it's a great position to be in. But uh, most importantly, it's, you know, it's helping the entire industry, um, you know, just 
be better appreciated and changing, you know, some of the misperceptions or misconceptions that that could be about, you know, what forestry is and what forestry does. Um, sure. And you know, my team has done a fantastic job with, with the storytelling, um, and in in multiple ways. You know, we get anecdotes. Um, there was one anecdote <clears throat> last year where uh, the investor team is. It's working with a with an investor that doesn't invest in Ryanair at this time, and another investor that does invest in, in the company, you know, has invested in the company. Send them one of our videos to this investor that we were trying to bring in, uh, and say, hey, this is the company you want to invest in, and watch this video. This is these are good guys, um, and you know, that's just music to our ears, just that, that happening. And right. there's a few of those that like that. So, um, so. That's <clears throat> that's what we've made the you know the the most progress um, from from a communication perspective. Excellent. Well, Alejandro, we're going to take a quick break here and come back on the other side with some additional questions. And just want to make sure we give a shout out to uh, Review Maxer, our presenting sponsor. Uh, they are online at reviewmaxer.com and help you uh, manage your online reviews and get more online reviews. Without them, this show wouldn't be possible. So we want to say thank you to Review Maxer, and we'll be right back. You're listening to On Top of PR with your host, Jason Mudd. Jason is a trusted advisor to some of America's most admired and fastest growing brands. He is the managing partner at Axia Public Relations, a PR agency that guides news, social, and web strategies for national companies. And now, back to the show. Welcome back. I'm Jason Mudd, your host for On Top of PR, and today I'm joined by Alejandro from Rayoneer. Alejandro, we're so glad you're here, and thank you for this great conversation. Um, I wanted to ask you next, kind of focusing on uh, who you describe as a customer uh, at Rayoneer, uh, who is that person? Do you have an avatar or a uh, buyer persona you've identified for buyers? We actually do. So, um as I was saying before, um, you know, on the forestry side, most of our customers are B two B, and on the on the real estate side, we have different segments of uh, of our real estate division. Uh, the one that I manage the marketing uh, for, um, we do, we do, we have five, and um, you know that we we're constantly looking at and we're constantly challenging ourselves on, you know, are these the right ones? And uh, we we recently undergone a project what we looked at it yet again and um it, it was clear to us that there was one that you know it was probably not as um as um relevant at this point and and, and but there was one that was missing and and so we kind of went to the switch to project of you know just adding one and, and dropping the other one um but but definitely something we you know we keep we keep an eye on the ball on that excellent and so what is it that uh this um your customers uh, what is it they know about your company today? Would you say? Um, I think it depends on on what side of the company. Um, you know, the the one that I was just talking about is Radiant, a real estate subsidiary, and um, in specifically, you know, there's a product line we call Radiant Places, and um, which is mostly people looking uh, for. You know, a bigger piece of land or an investment. Um, you know, not not people looking for, you know, a home site being, you know, the the half an acre, quarter acre, on, on, on suburban US, but more, you know, the one, the two, the three, the fifty, the twenty uh, acre type. And um, and they know a lot because you know we a lot of what we do is content marketing and what on it, uh, developing content. We have a blog <clears throat> called Rethink Rural, uh, where we help people, you know, understand what it's like to have this sort of more rural lifestyle. Uh, and um, and we help them, you know, if they're on the fence, we help them, help them transition to it. Um, so they know they know a lot about who we are and what we do. Excellent. And, and in an ideal world, what is it that you would want them to know? If you could brainwash or, or wave a magic wand over your mm -hmm. audience, what would they know, your customers? I would say, um, you know clearly that we have the solution to their problems um that's that's what you know i'm selling i'm selling a dream i'm not saying i'm not selling you know a piece of dirt i'm selling a dream i'm selling a 
you know, a kid's running on the background, somebody on an ATV, somebody on a, you know, on a four wheeler, um, somebody building a barn and, uh, you know, enjoying a different lifestyle. We got that. We can, you know, we can make those dreams happen because we, we got what they need uh, in the place they need it. So that's what I love them to know. And so if they knew that, what would you want them to then do in return? What, what's a call to action or an action you'd like to see them take? Well, clearly, you know, we work with a um, with the set of brokers, with the with the pool of brokers um, across, you know, the entire footprint, and um, call them, call them, call them now, before we run out of land. Call them. So you want them to call Rainier? No, we want to call them. We want them to call the brokers. Um, you know, most of our transactions are managed through brokers, and uh -huh. so we want them to to call the brokers and uh, okay. sign the piece of paper. Okay. Well, let's talk about what's new. What are you working on right now that has you excited? Um, well, there's one thing we through through the pandemic, um, we um, it actually goes back to 2019. We we took a look at our values, our corporate values, and um, and we we realized that there was one value that was not there that should be there, and that sort of trigger this process where we said, you know, before we add the value and we remove one, why don't we just stop the ball and take a look at them, you know, as a, as a value set and, and challenge ourselves to think about, you know, uh, is this value set, you know, you know, is this timely, you know, what, what should our values be and what, what are our values and is there a disconnect there? And, um, and, and this is not a, it, it's the natural evolution of the company, you know, with a, um, 92 year old company, 94 year old company rather. Um, and so it's it's the natural evolution. Uh, and so last year, you know, I put a team together and, and we work with the senior team very closely and just taking a look at our values and understanding, you know, what makes us different, what makes us unique, what gets us excited. You know, if you think about the, the typical Rayonier person, um, what are they made of? Um, and so we develop a new value set. We refreshed our values, and um, and now I'm in the in the midst of um, launching the, the the communication campaign to let the organization know uh, that we have done that and and to get everyone excited about this new value set. So um, we're wrapping up. We have one more video interview to do uh, early February. We're in the middle of uh, editing. Um, doing you know we're gonna do collateral we're gonna do um you know we're gonna help leaders in the company cascade the communication so we're working on developing all that content um so it's a it's been a great project uh to get us here um it was not easy because it's one of those where um kind of you know it when you see it and and so we had to iterate multiple times until we finally got to a place where we say yeah that's it that's that's the value set these are these are the values that define who we are and what, what, what are we made of? Um, and and we have a really good we have a really good you know plan for rolling this out to the organization that um, you know it's coming out soon. Very mm -hmm. nice, congratulations! Thank you. That sounds Thank exciting and certainly mm -hmm. uh, certainly a lot of work. I know when we were working on our core values here to, as, at our agency, mm -hmm. you know that was a difficult challenge and required significant uh, collaboration and input from you know, uh, various members of the team and, and, and then you've got to build consensus and help articulate and communicate why you chose those values and what they mean and then live and breathe those values. And, you know, I, I think the expression is, you know, recruit, hire, uh, promote, train, and, and even fire if need be, uh, to those core values and live and breathe those core values. And so, um, yeah. And, and, I, and honestly, the, the, the one, I think the one golden nugget for us was to, and it, it, I, I'm going to say it, and it sounds so silly and easy, but it was to listen uh, and mm -hmm. to listen, you know, with intent. And, mm -hmm. and the second we stopped and listened, when I say we, it's the team, the, you know, that was sort of working with the senior team. Um, the, the second we stopped and listened, those values were in front of us because that's, you know, you hear the, the senior team talking about them all mm -hmm. the time. So, mm -hmm. um up until that point, it was difficult. We try, you know, what about this and what about that? And we, let's go here, let's go there. And they were all like, mm, yeah, mm, 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 yeah, maybe. Um, but the second we stopped and listened, and uh, you know, with intent and that was what was being said and how, magic just happened. And and we got that 
very quickly and you could see it in their faces you know the entire senior team excited about yes 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 that's it that's it mm -hmm. so um it was fun <clears throat> that's really good advice uh you know on on previous episodes we've talked about the idea that um you know the best thing you can do is is listen to your audience and more importantly make your audience or not more importantly equally important or there after you've listened is make your audience be the star right in the spotlight and focus mm -hmm. on them in your storytelling if your storytelling is all about us us me me and i i uh nobody cares but if you can shift the spotlight onto them and say you know you and and we help you or you'll be able to do this and focus on the benefits of of working with them suddenly you've got uh, an audience who is more engaged and more interested because you know we're all a little bit selfish and as soon as your marketing can shift from being selfish about you and being selfish about your audience uh, you'll see a lot more success in my experience yeah and I, I could not agree more about that and you know there's two things that come to mind one is um, you know you gotta walk you, you gotta you gotta help the audience get to where you are and you know in this particular project you know us as a team we want on a on a on a journey um, to sort of dissect who we were, and then we forgot to bring people along. So the first meeting, you know, they were looking at us like, okay, you're 20 miles away, I don't see you, I don't know what you're doing. Uh, and and so, you know, we had to pause and okay, say, okay, well, this is the journey we just walked on together. And okay, and uh, and then the other piece too is, um, you know, it, it's authenticity and, and it's a word that is used a lot you know this day and age and, and for us it, it, it's key um you know you you'll hardly see any stories that we do where you see the senior team on the stories or where you see the leaders on the stories you, you get to see the people that actually get the job done mm -hmm. um and that and those are real people like you and i and and um you know there's nothing different uh, you know for, uh, about them and us and um and their story it's is what you want to hear and the, the story tell, told by them uh it's a lot more relevant and meaningful that if it's washed down you know even unintentionally by several layers of you know sort of leadership and management so we make it a point that you know any stories we do the people actually doing the job those are the ones that you're going to hear from nice yeah i like that that's very real especially when you're for example you know my background's in journalism and when you're working with the news media, they don't always want to hear, they definitely don't want to hear from the marketing person or the PR person. They want to talk to either key leadership, uh, thought leaders and influencers in the company, or the person who's, you know, actually developing the project product or in, doing the engineering or working on the floor, or working in the trenches. So they can explain, you know, the product in detail or the, the, um, you know the manufacturing stages and that kind of thing so well we're qu quickly running out of time so let me try to ask questions here um uh thinking about the future uh if we were having this conversation three years from today and you were looking back on those last three years what would have happened in your life both personally and professionally uh for yourself and the company uh that would make you uh so happy uh in those three years so it's three okay. years from today Three years into day, I probably have one kid that drives and that's care of the bejesus out of me, but that, that's real. <laughs> uh, and then professionally, I think what you'll see is we manage to empower people um, within the company to be storytellers alongside with us. And I, I always say the same thing. We're never going to be the best storytelling company in the industry if it's up to just the four of us in communications. Mm -hmm. We need to bring all 400 people in the company uh and let them you know empower them to be storytellers so um that's what we're going that's the future good and so it sounds like one of the obstacles to overcome uh to get you there is what you just said which is you know allowing others in the organization uh to be empowered to tell that story and to put the spotlight on them as the storyteller as opposed to somebody from corporate communications telling the story that's that's exactly yes that's it that's it that's a roadblock that we're, we're working yeah. on removing well, so if that's an obstacle, tell me what advantages do you have in getting there? In getting there? Mm -hmm. What's um, working in your favor to get there? I think, you know, the, the momentum of the, the wave that we built over the last three years and the mm -hmm. impact that um, taking a different route, I suppose, you know, on, on, on the communications front, uh, not being silent but rather you know being loud and and telling what we do because we do good stuff 
Uh, you know, I don't need to fake it. What we do is just good. Uh, good. And so uh, just being real and, and kind of having built that wave uh, of and the momentum that we have, that's, that, that's pushing us in that direction. Excellent. So um, what would it mean to you personally and to the company uh, to get there in three years from now when you're, you're sitting in that moment and it's three years from now and you're enjoying the success? What would that mean to you personally and what would that mean to the company? Um, I think for the company, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be huge. And, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, and, and I think your audience knows this far better than I do. It's, you know, we're making the company human by getting people to talk about what they do. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, a piece of concrete anymore. It's not a, you know, you know, we always said that a company is an article of, you know, it's, it's just an article of incorporation. What makes mm -hmm. the company is the people. And so, and it's very hard to argue with people. Uh, you may agree or may you disagree, but it's hard to argue with people. It's hard to be pissed off at people. Uh, and, and, but you might be, you know, you may argue, you know, against the corporation. Uh, so for the company, it's going to be great. And, you know, we're going to change the perception of, you know, what people think of forestry as an industry and, and people are going to understand how forestry helps, right. you know, rather than not. Um, so that's that's the professional side. And then for me personally, you know, when we embark on this journey, I tell my team that we were going to create history and we have and we nice. will. So, you know, we're going to look back and say, hey, um, you know, look at what we've done. This is it's just huge. It's awesome. That's great. Um, what is what is some of the best advice you've ever received? <laughs> um, I've been thinking about that. Um, I think it's it's two things. Um, one is. Um, and this is one, that I, I'm going to say just one, because this is one that I talk to my kids a lot about, and, and it's um, stuff happens. You know, you have little to no control over the stuff that happens, whether good or bad. Um, but what defines you is what do you do when stuff happens? Mm. So, you know, you may, you may get in a dire situation. You may get in a difficult situation. You may have almost no control and whether you found yourself in that situation or not. But what defines you and who you are is when, what do you do when you find yourself there? Um, and to me, that's, that's super meaningful. Um, you know, you can get pissed off, you can, you know, lock yourself in a room, uh, or you can just face it and see what you do with it and, you know, and just try to get through it. Um, so that, that's one that it's, it's very meaningful to me and, I, and, and one that I talk to my kids, you know, almost on a daily basis, you know, because they're, they're at that age where they're, you know, building their own personalities and character. Right. And that's what defines your character is what do you do when stuff happens? And I typically don't say stuff. It starts with this, but it's not stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you're, uh, you're reminding me, uh, I'm always talking about the importance of one, improvising, and two, integrity. And I think those go hand in hand with exactly what you're saying is that, you know, we... It. Uh, and and especially in the PR profession, I've learned you have to improvise. And so you may have woken up and thought you were doing A, B, and C, and then the world <laughs> turned upside down, and you're doing one, two, and three instead. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, social media pros will say, "Yeah, well, if, if we post about that today, we've already got these other posts scheduled." And I'm like, "Okay, well, just improvise. You know, like things change, and and you've got to learn to improvise." And then, to your point, integrity. You know, when when the going gets tough, you know, people get to see your true character. Um, so, um, here's one of my favorite questions to ask: If you left your current job today, what advice would you give your successor? Um. Hmm. That is a very good question. Um, I'd say build relationships, build relationships, and build more relationships. Um, yeah, that's it. I love Just it. Spend a lot of time building relationships within the company and and outside the company. Um, you know, out of what I do matters if and only it helps the company. Um, you know, we don't do you know, we have our own sort of set of priorities within my team. And one is intentionality. You know, we're very intentional about what, what we do. We don't do things because we like them. We, not, we don't do things because we like the design of a brochure. Because we, we do things for a reason and because, you know, they matter to the company. And so I can only know what matters to the company, you know, by I, you can be very, very smart and figure it out on your own. But mm -hmm. most people, at least me, 
you know, you got to have those relationships and you got to make those connections internally to understand, okay, what is it that it's, right. you know, what's, what's the, what's the, the rock on the, on the shoe that we got to remove. Great. Okay. So the last question, and then we'll have to, we'll have to jump is, um, uh, the person that's replacing you in your role, what would he or she do differently than you're doing in your role hmm. today? Um, I don't know. I think, you know, uh, I've seen this, you know, in in my life, in my in my career up until now. We all bring something different to the table. Right. Um, you know, what I bring to the table is is the strategy and is connecting actions on the ground with the vision. Um, you know, my predecessors, you know, the, who, whomever succeeds me, um, you know, may bring a different skill set and may do things differently. And uh, and I don't know. Um, yeah. It, it, it's a question I like to ask myself to make sure that I'm focused on what's most important and, uh, you know, make sure that I'm keeping myself sharp and, and thinking, uh, uh, you know, futuristically and also just in, a, in a, a, an attitude of reform, right? So what, what would somebody come in behind me and do absolutely differently and why? And then am I not doing that because uh, I'm afraid to or because I don't value it or because it's not to my strengths? And then I adjust and pivot uh, either myself or my team accordingly. That, that's a great point. I, I always say that the most clarity that one has around any job is the first 90 days when you, <laughs> yes. you know, when you're not consumed with the, you know, yeah. when you don't get so low in the ground that it's hard to see, you know, yes. the forest for the trees. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to put that in practice. Well, I like the cliche forced through the trees, uh, from somebody who works, uh, at Rainier. So I really <laughs> like that. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'll say. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to connect. Um, if our audience uh, enjoyed the conversation today, uh, how do they connect with you best um, through, uh, you know, social media or email or what, what's their preferred way to kind of follow you and stay in touch with you? Easiest way, LinkedIn. Um, Alejandro Barbero in LinkedIn. Um, uh, if not, Alejandro.Barbero at Rainier.com, but it's so long that I'm going to have to spell it. So typically <laughs> LinkedIn, LinkedIn is the easiest way to find me. And, okay. um, and that's a great sort of starting point to spring from there. Is there anything or that we, oh, you can, ahead. you can, you can see Rainier.com slash stories. That's, that's the other place to go to. Uh, and okay, you perfect. can, you can see all the fun stuff we do. Anything else you wanted to close on? No, much. I, 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 you know, I think you said it on the onset, we've known each other for a number of years. I, I do appreciate you know, the, uh, the discussion. Uh, it's, it's, it's refreshing. And uh, I, I do appreciate the invite. My pleasure. Thanks for being our guest. And we look forward to staying in touch. Thank you. Well, that does it for another great episode of On Top of PR. I uh, really enjoyed the authenticity of this interview and this session together. Uh, I'm sure you will too. And uh, do us a favor. If you enjoyed this episode, please uh, like, follow, subscribe. Uh, and even better would be if you shared this episode with a colleague or uh, left us a review so others can find us too. So once again, thanks for tuning in and uh, really appreciate you and your support. Last shout out to our sponsor, Review Maxer. Be well, everybody. This has been On Top of PR with Jason Mudd, presented by Review Maxer. 